I'm Daughter of Darkness. Welcome to the family. Police officers are here to protect the living, but sometimes their jobs bring them face to face with the paranormal. Those are the stories I'll be presenting here tonight. Be sure to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central for new content. And if you'd like to hear more stories like this, click on the end screen at the end of the video or on the link in the pinned comment below. The great gods of YouTube will smile down upon us if you do. But for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way. And let's get scared together, 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 together. I'm a detective, and I spent some time working as an expert on crimes against children. One night, a young woman with a toddler came in to the precinct to report that her ex-boyfriend assaulted her during a custody argument. It was one of the most violent and sadistic cases I've ever had, so I'll spare you the gruesome details. I still have no idea how this woman was able to make her way on her own to the precinct and with a toddler in tow. I'm a child forensics interviewer, and part of my job that day was to talk to the toddler because the victim, the mother, said that the little girl was present during the assault. The child said that her father was very angry and was hitting her mom. Then she said what she called a nice woman appeared out of nowhere. And when she did, the child couldn't see past the woman to watch the assault any longer. This nice woman held her in her arms and assured her that both she and her mother were going to be safe. She sang her a song in a different language to soothe her. The toddler then said that the nice woman went over to the front door and knocked very loudly. After that, the nice woman helped them both get into the car before flying away. Later, while interviewing the mother... She said that her ex-boyfriend had a knife out and he was about to cut her throat open, but he got distracted for some reason and he ran out of the apartment. She had no explanation as to why. Eight hours later, the suspect was caught. He confessed to everything, and when I asked him about the knife to the throat, he said this, I swear to God I was going to cut her throat open, but I heard a loud knock on the door and I thought it was the police, so I ran. He's now serving life in prison, and the mom and toddler are doing well. But I'd love to know more about this nice woman. I remember my father telling me a story about when he was a police officer in New Hampshire. One cold night... Dispatch got a call from someone reporting seeing a little girl wandering around the lake by herself late at night. My father and every available officer responded to try to find the little girl. He and his partner were the first to arrive at the scene. They got out of the car and started walking towards the shore. As they neared the water, my father's partner hit him on the shoulder and pointed towards the lake. There was the little girl, at 2 a.m. in late November, standing in the freezing cold water with bare feet, wearing nothing but a thin white nightgown. Dad said every hair on the back of his neck stood up when he saw her. He and his partner looked at one another, knowing that something wasn't right about the situation. They walked a bit closer, and my father knelt down on the ground and held his arms out, calling to the little girl to come to him. She turned her attention to my father, and started walking out of the water towards him. As this was happening, another unit pulled up to witness that the little girl was walking to my father. But when she got about eight feet away from my father, she disappeared into thin air. There was nothing left but tiny little footprints in the dirt. They all stood there in disbelief, trying to figure out just what had happened. One of them finally said, how the hell are we going to explain this one? I was a deputy sheriff for 13 years. I worked in a jail with a big population. 
I was a team leader of the tactical response team that roamed the hallways and responded to the emergencies that arose, not just fights, but medical emergencies too. In the admissions area, we had isolation cells for the inmates who came in there and had problems, either mental or physical. I responded one night to a guy trying to hang himself in cell number three. He had been rushed to the hospital, and when we reviewed the camera footage to assist in our report, all we saw was him standing quietly in the cell for several minutes, just looking into the camera. Then the camera glitched out, and when it came back on, the guy was hanging himself. Over the next three days in that same cell, we had two more incidents. One was another failed suicide attempt by hanging, but the other guy was successful in bashing his head against the wall so hard that he killed himself. And in both cases, they were again staring into the camera for several minutes. Then it glitched out, and when it came back on, the one was attempting to hang himself, and the other guy was lying on the floor after breaking his skull open. To this day, Cell 3 still freaks me out. It makes me think that there's an entity in that cell causing people to kill themselves, and it speaks to them through that camera. Back in the 90s, I worked as a police officer in a small rural town in Nebraska. I was patrolling one winter, and we had several abandoned houses in town. One of them seemed to have attracted a lot of copper thieves, so we were told to keep an eye on the place. I drove by around 7 p.m. It was a corner lot, so I had a very clear view of the house. Nothing seemed out of place. But about two hours later, I drove by again, and the back door was wide open. Now, I knew the back door hadn't been open the first time I drove by, and looking on the snow on the ground around the house, there were no footprints. So I was thinking, what the hell? I called dispatch telling them the address and that there was a door open, and I told them I was going in to investigate. I walked up to the door, pulled out my flashlight and shined it inside. The house had been gutted for the most part. The walls had been torn down, and there were piles of debris everywhere. Since there were no footprints in the snow other than my own, and the dust on the floor inside showed no footprints, I chalked it up to the wind blowing the door open. I was about to close and secure the door when I heard a loud thump coming from upstairs and what sounded like kids laughing. So I entered the house and I yelled, Police department, come downstairs! Again, I heard more laughing. I told dispatch that it sounded like there were children playing upstairs. I started making my way through to the staircase, all the while carefully checking out the main floor. Two more times I heard something upstairs, but since no one was responding, I started thinking maybe it was just an animal. Still, I swore it was kids laughing. So I went upstairs, and it went quiet. The upstairs was small, with the hallway at the top of the stairs, one bedroom to the left, one to the right, and another one straight ahead. As I got to the top of the stairs, I heard a thump in the bedroom to the left. I carefully peeked around the door. It was just an empty room, with a small pile of plaster and wood debris in the middle. And I kid you not, sitting on top of that pile of debris, was a page torn out of a children's book with the picture of a police officer on it. My hair stood on end. I left that room and quickly cleared the rest of the upstairs. I told dispatch that there was nobody in the house, locked the back door, and never went back there again. My father was a cop in Boston. He told me of a very memorable call he took back in the early 90s. It was a domestic dispute call, and when he and his partner arrived, the man who had made the call was waiting outside, covered up in blankets, shivering to death, on a hot day in the middle of August. Apparently, he and his wife had a fight. 
She was angry, so she made a voodoo doll of him, threw it in the freezer, and chained and padlocked it inside. The man wanted them to break the chain open to get the voodoo doll out so he wouldn't freeze to death. But they weren't going to destroy property over that, so they sent him to the hospital. My father said that the guy's teeth were chattering and his lips were turning blue, and it was sunny and 85 degrees outside. I guess the moral of the story is, don't make your wife mad if she practices voodoo. I'm a cop, and one night a burglar alarm went off in a thrift shop. Normally the alarms don't go off requiring police response unless at least three sensors pick up movement. So my partner and I and another unit set up to canvas around the building. We went in announcing ourselves as police but got no response. We cleared the entire two stories and didn't find anything. By that time, the store owner had arrived and he was outside with his iPad to show us the camera footage. The three sensors that got tripped show what appeared to be a faint gust of wind moving through the clothing racks. Since nothing was out of order, the owner reset the alarms and then we all left. Fifteen minutes later, the store owner called us again. He wanted us to come back so that he could show us something that he had found on the camera footage. On the footage, clear as day. As my partner and I were leaving after clearing the building, you can see a shadow figure waving goodbye to us. We did look into it, but we didn't find anything regarding any death in that building. But as long as it's friendly, that ghost can trip the alarm whenever it wants, though I still won't go inside without a partner. My friend's father is a police officer in Illinois. He and his partner were on the night shift when they were called to investigate a break-in at the local morgue. They arrived to find the custodian waiting for them out front. The custodian said that he'd been mopping the floors when he saw a movement out of the corner of his eye. He looked up and saw someone quickly crossing from one side of the hallway to the other. He couldn't tell them much about the person because he had been turning off the lights as he worked his way through the building. He just saw a dim outline, but enough to be sure of what he had seen. My friend's dad and his partner entered the morgue. They announced themselves as police, then called out to anyone who might be inside, but they got no answer. Then they began to do a sweep of the place, walking down the central corridor with their hands on their guns, checking each room. His partner saw a woman running down the hallway and around the corner. He pointed his gun and yelled, Hey, stop! Turn around! They both advanced down the corridor, calling out to the woman to show herself and telling her that they wouldn't hurt her. My friend's dad reached the end of the corridor first and with his back to the wall, carefully peered around the corner. It was a woman with long blonde hair standing by the door. He stepped out from behind the corner to talk to her, but she opened the door and disappeared into the darkness inside and shut the door behind her. He sprinted up to the door to pull the handle, but it was locked. He banged on the door and called out to her, but with no reply. The door had a deadbolt on it, so they got the keys from the custodian to unlock it. They yelled, We're coming in. Have your hands up. They entered the room and switched on the light. It was empty, except for two gurneys in the middle of the room. One had nothing on it, and the other was covered with a sheet, and it had what appeared to be a body underneath it. My friend's dad slowly approached, and he pulled down the sheet. There lay the woman that he had seen with the blonde hair, and she had a toe tag stating that she had died four days earlier. He's a very devout Christian and he doesn't believe in the supernatural, even now. But he doesn't know what to think about what he witnessed that night.
I'm a police officer, and I was called to a residence to do a mental evaluation for a 5150. I got there and I spoke to a 50-year-old woman who told me that her 20-year-old son was under the influence of an unknown drug, and he kept repeating that he couldn't go into his bedroom because there was an old man hanging from the rafters. She was too scared to go into the room to investigate it herself, so she wanted us to do it. I then spoke with her son, who was clearly under the influence of some kind of stimulant. He said that he was told by a female spirit not to enter his bedroom because her father, who was dressed in his military uniform, had hung himself from the ceiling. I went and checked the room out and of course nobody was hanging there. As I was explaining this to the mother, that there was no body in the bedroom, a veteran officer arrived on the scene to assist me. He pulled me aside and told me that earlier in his career, he had responded to this very same house. And he said in that bedroom, he investigated a suicide by hanging by an older male subject. He didn't remember all the details, so I looked it up on the report management system in our patrol car. And sure enough, the officer was correct. The subject who died was a World War II veteran, and he was dressed in his military uniform when he hung himself from the rafters. My father was a cop, but he spent the latter days of his career as the fire safety director at a massive mental institution. OSHA had to come to inspect the facility for fire compliance. They even had to inspect parts of the building that were no longer in use. So the inspectors went to the old part of the building where they used to house the criminally insane. The people who had stayed there were the absolute worst of the worst. Serial killers, rapists, cannibals, you name it. My father left them with keys and a flashlight because the electricity no longer worked in that part of the building. A little while later, the inspectors radioed back to my father, saying that they were hearing voices and footsteps. But my father said that was impossible. That part of the building hadn't been used in years. Not even squatters could get in there because each section was isolated and had locks on every door to prevent escape. But the inspectors were freaked out, and they actually fled without finishing the job. My dad decided to go in alone to check the alarm boxes that they'd missed. As he was working, he felt like somebody was watching him from down the hall. He looked up, and he saw a shadow forming at the end of the hall. First the head, then the shoulders, then the torso, but no legs and there were just two empty holes where the eyes should have been. My dad noped it right the heck out of there. Since then, the hospital has been shut down, but it's been featured on Ghost Adventures, Ghost Hunters, and a bunch of other TV shows and movies. My dad has even been in some of them. Jason from Ghost Hunters called it the scariest place he's ever investigated. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't mind having a job that involves seeing some of these paranormal things. They all seem pretty interesting to me, and they bring a bit of excitement to an otherwise boring day. I'd like to thank you so much for listening tonight. Click on the video above to hear more stories like this, so you can stay scared until we meet again, my friends. <laughs>